Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon to you all. I declare this hearing open. Case 1362, Nadia Mussini and family against Mexico. I'm Lucinda Mar Julissa Mandija, first vice president. I have here Flavia Piovesan, the second vice president and the rapporteur of the children's rights. Madam Adosemena, I greet you all, all the states, all the representatives of the state, and I will give the floor now to the Executive Secretariat, Marisol Branchard. Thank you very much, Madam President. Good afternoon to everyone. This case is related to the alleged responsibility of the Mexican state because of the lack of protection in the murder of Nadia Mussinio within a context of gender discrimination, as well as by the alleged obstacles for access to justice by the relatives and the lack of due diligence in the investigation and research of all the facts that were denounced. In 2018, the admissibility report number 9418 was approved, where it was admissible to, search, to conduct this idea, um, taking into account the lack of legal justice of non-protection by the law. This hearing aims at receiving information from the parties and receiving information, current information about the case. We'll also receive the um, opinion of an expert. Thank you, Secretary Blanchard. So we will start with the declaration of the expert, Edith Olivares Barreto. So, Madam Expert, you can take the floor. Tell us your full name and where you live. Hello, my name is Edith Olivares Ferreto. I was born in San Jose in Costa Rica and I currently live in the city of Mexico, Mexico. Okay, so now we'll start with the first part, which are questions by the petitioner's party and then we'll do the same by the state. Go ahead, you have the floor. Good morning, commissioners and everyone, delegation of the Mexican state. My name is Carla Michez Salas from the Group of Action for social justice, an organization that represents the family of Musinho Marquez. Madam expert, could you tell the commission which is the context within the state of Mexico in terms of access to justice in case of cases of justice, of violence against women in case of murders, both at the time when these events happened and currently? Good afternoon. Yes, I wanted. I would like to clarify that I was invited to this hearing as a part of uh, Amnesty International, and that this analysis is based on the case of Nadia Mussinho, which is part of our case deficiencies in criminal justice analyzed in the case of Mexico. This report was published in September this year and the methodology that was used is included in the document that I sent here as well. The state of Mexico has 17 million inhabitants. It's the most populated part of the country and was of the with greater amount of, of inhabitants. It's very close to the capital city. So it, it encompasses the perigraph, the, the surrounding areas as well. 76% of the population for almost 14 million people lived in poverty or in vulnerability in that area because of a lack of income. The state of Mexico is the second entity with a perception of public insecurity and with greater the greater rate of crimes. It's one of the largest rates in Mexico. And it can be related to problems with the authorities because the problems why people do not denounce um, the crimes is extortion or fear, or they just think it's a loss of time. In Mexico, there is large perception that the authorities are corrupt, mainly the mm, transit police and also the public ministry or the state attorney general's office. In Mexico, there is the highest index of a rate of 
impunity, which is something important as well. All these conditions create a very unsafe surroundings environment for women, made worse by the deficiencies made by the institutions in the prevention of violence against women, which give way to feminicides. From uh, Amnesty International, we've insisted over and over to the authorities of the Mexican state and to the rest of the country that feminicides can be prevented most of the victims are killed by people that they know and in many cases they had uh, gone to ask for protection or protection services to the authorities such as Nadia did. A true risk assessment and protection measures would enable them to avoid most of the feminicides that take place in this country. And that's why we say that the state is responsible for the feminicides that are committed, even if they are committed by individuals. I need to tell you that in 2004, the state of Mexico was first in the feminicides, every, feminicides rate every 100 inhabitants of the country. And over the last few years, it has been still one of the largest areas we, uh, that keep the highest rate of feminicides and feminicide research. The authorities do not, should not say that because of the amount of people, uh, that that's the justification so as not to conduct any further research or to enable women to live free of violence. 13 years after the ruling of Campo Algodonero, the feminicides still are still ongoing. In 2004, when Nadia Mussinho was a victim of feminicide, 1,200 women had been killed in Mexico. For 2020, last year, there were 3,273 deaths of, of women, 900 of which are being investigated as feminicides. In order for our report, we documented the criminal uh, reports of four feminicides that include, which include the, the one of Nadia. And we found three deficiencies. The first is that the investigation of public officials, they lose the evidence that is related to the facts. This loss happens because the authorities do not inspect the, the area of the crime, they not keep the evidence, and they do not conduct some of the analysis or research at the right time, leaving aside some of the most important testimonies. They do not investigate enough, they do not always analyze the whole possible lines of research. And the third one is that the gender perspective is not adequately applied in Amnesty International. The due diligence is not implemented as it should be implemented in the cases of violent deaths of women, and it creates the loss of evidence which might be determining in some cases in order to determine the, the criminal case. Some of the research investigation lines are not designed from a gender perspective either, so sometimes they investigate cases that are feminicide as if they were suicides or they are or people are not uh, considered to be uh, suspects when they should be. The lack of gender perspective can also be seen in the constant use of stereotypes and the victimization of the victims again. Madam Expert, what are the structural problems that happened at the time of the events and currently that hinder access to justice for women that are victims to violence? In our report, we saw the following structural problems in our General Attorney's Office of Mexico. The deficiencies happened since the beginning, since the murder of Nadia Mussinho, to cases that happened uh, three years ago. First, the public officers do not have the necessary conditions to conduct this research. They are overloaded with work. They don't have any inputs, the minimum inputs in order to conduct these tasks. For example, there is a scarcity of cars, official cars. So the officials needs to go, needs, need to use their own cars or public transport. The use of public transport in Mexico is very complex because of the urban structure. And that implies that they spend a long time, many hours of their days, 
in this place. And that is like going from one place to the other. And that's why they keep a delay. The personnel also has to pay you from their own pockets part of the inputs or the material in order to conduct the investigations. They don't have enough space to keep the evidence. And that's why they usually get destroyed or contaminated. The officials do not have enough specialized training in order to conduct these investigations. There are some training courses that they had received about human rights and about gender perspectives, but they still need to focus on the technical aspects and about how to apply the gender perspective correctly when developing this investigation. Finally, in our report, we say that there is no true supervision of the work that allows for uh, any response in case of a negligence committed during the investigation. All these program problems are hindering the process, thus creating problems in access to justice for the families of the victims. Thank you very much, Madam Expert. In one minute and a half, because we are running out of time, which are the obstacles that you that families find, families of women that and that suffered feminicide, in particular in the state of Mexico. From Amnesty International, we found two large groups of obstacles. The first one is that seeking justice requires time and it is costly from an emotional and economic point of view because of the deficiencies that the research shows very frequently the family becomes the first driver for the investigation that implies that they need to go over and over to the general attorney's office or for example in order to make research tasks all that makes families have to lose their jobs or or because they need to focus on the investigation and then this creates economic problems for them, creating also problems in their health and not being able to afford the rest of the expenses. Second, seeking justice in the state of Mexico is dangerous. On the one hand, some families are threatened by the ones who are responsible of killing of the feminicides of their daughters or sisters. And even if they ask for protection to the authorities, this is not enough. And some of them have to move to go to other places in order to receive protection. And sometimes the authorities are the ones who threat or harass the families. It can be threats like not um, asking them not to continue with this or not to go to any communication means. But then in the cases that we analyzed in our report, the families said that they had received mistreatment by people that were public officers. So that's um, institutional violence. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the petitioner party and the expert. And now the state has the floor for 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. In particular, I would like to greet the commissioners, uh, Commissioners Arroz, Mena, Mantilla, and Biovesan, the officials of the commission, and of course, the family members and representatives of the victim, the civil society, and all those who are following this hearing. We thank the commission for this space to present the uh, final message of the state of Mexico. Uh, the state will do so with regards to case uh, 13.652, Nadia Alejandro, Alejandro Mucinio Marquez and others, and both in an oral manner and also in a written form. Uh, this statement will be delivered to the commission after the hearing. Now I will give the floor to my colleagues from the Mexican Delegation Marcos Moreno Baez, the coordinator of international affairs for human rights, Virtia Garcia Espinosa, works in the attention for crimes related to gender based crimes from the public prosecutor, and Carolina Alanis Moreno, an executive commissioner for victim attention also in the state of Mexico. Marcos Vaez, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. I, right now at this point of questions and answers, I would like to, before exp expressing our position, I would like to give the floor to our prosecutor, 
in the state of Mexico so she can pose the questions to the experts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioners, thank you, dear colleagues. We thank our expert for her uh, valuable contribution and the uh, state of Mexico would like to respectfully ask these questions. We are not trying to question the uh, expert in her person, but just provide other arguments with regards to what's been stipulated. Well, our question number one is as follows. Are you aware of the covenant for coordination held between uh, the state of Mexico and the secretary for the emerging plan for the prevention of feminicides? If you do so, could you explain how you incorporated them to your study and how you assess them? Are you going to ask all three questions? As you wish. Madam Roth, I don't know if you know, the state has 10 minutes for questions. I don't know if how the hearing works. You have 10 minutes for questions and then the, uh, the, the expert will reply. So please ask your questions. Of course. The second question is, how many cases of feminicides did you take into account for drafting your statement? Number three, are you aware of the work of the special group for the attention and investigation of high impact affairs related to violent women, death, deaths of women? If you do, could you tell us if you have incorporated the impact of this work uh, in your study? And finally, are you aware of the operation of the FEMIOMI platform? If you do, could you tell us how you incorporated this in your report? That would be all, thank you. I'm sorry, just for um, our records, once again, uh, um, remember the name of Graciela Rock on the square of the prosecutor? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Madam Ambassador. I'm going to ask the uh, team to uh, correct her name. I apologize for that. The state already has uh, has five more minutes. Are you going to ask any more questions? Those are our only questions. Thank you. Okay, now I will give the floor to my colleagues in the commission for five minutes in case you have any questions. I will start with Commissioner Arosemena, rapporteur, the country rapporteur and, and rapporteur for the rights of children. Yes, Commissioner. You are muted. Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. It's raining cats and dogs here, so I had to wear my, to use my headphones. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, then, these are my questions for the expert. First of all, I'd like to greet the representatives of the state. Thank you, Luz Elena, for being here. You and all your team. I would like to thank the representatives of the petitioner, the expert, and I would like to greet, even though she is not, they are not here, the family members of the alleged victim. Even though this report is focused on the feminicide unto itself, at some point, uh, I'm sorry, in that moment in time and in that context, but I would like to ask the expert if during your assessment, the issue of the participation of children or adolescents in these uh, investigation processes, I, want, I would like to ask you about that. And in that um, evidence material that needs to be assessed, by the authorities. How do you assess that situation in which the 
children of the alleged victim were when they were refused their possibility to express themselves when they had been witnesses because the death took place in their presence. I would like to know that. And also, as the state asked, are you aware of the effectiveness, these alert mechanisms in terms of violence against women and the gender perspective, how effective are these mechanisms in terms of prevention? That would be all, Madam Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Rosemena. Commissioner Piovesan, do you have any questions? Thank you very much, First Vice President. I would like to greet the victims' representatives, the representatives of the state, our dear ambassador, Luz, and the expert. I have three questions. The first one, uh, since Campo Algodonero, since Cotton Field, we have seen more and more um, murderers in Mexico, more feminicides in Mexico, a greater amount of number of uh, murderers and also violence against women in general. I've also um, heard you speaking about the challenges in terms of access to justice, how dangerous it is to seek justice. But first, I'd like to understand if since the uh, case of Nadia, there were programs effective responses as the commissioner as commissioner rosemena was asking have there been effective policies in uh, the prevention of gender-based violence the second question is about the victims is there a culture for the defense of uh, the rights in terms of um, promoting the mechanisms for reporting and also the protocol after the Campo Algodonero cotton field um, case, due diligence. According to your assessment as an expert, what would be the um, measures adopted by the Mexican state for prevention against gender-based violence, especially in terms of specific protocols to fight this type of violence that um, is based on asymmetrical power relationships. So it has a lot to do with uh, stigmatization and um, this the lack of balance in power. Um, I have one specific question. In your study, the one you've presented, when considering femicides, have you also considered femicide attempts, those women who were almost victims of femicide but survived? In your experience, has the response of the answer uh, focused on that particular circumstance? I mean, are they considered survivors of a femicide attempt? Now I will give the floor to the expert. She has five minutes, and if she doesn't, if the time is not enough, she can send answer her answers in written form, and that will be great as well. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. I will try to um, re reply in general. With regards to the methodology, we performed a study with four cases of femicides who were preceded by a disappearance, including the case of Nadia Mocinho and two feminicides that were that are more recent that took place only three years ago. So we reviewed in detail the entire uh, file and we also carried out over 40 interviews with public officials from the public prosecution um, experts, um, of course, the organizations, uh, that are joining the cases and attorneys. We did not include in this investigation 
femicide attempts, but we do have information. And we know that not only in the state of Mexico, but in other public prosecutions, the victims of these attempts are facing the problem that their cases are being managed as not as attempt to femicide, but as lesions. Now, uh, with regards to the participation of children, which is fundamental in this case, we believe it is very serious that the uh, public prosecutor's office had refused to accept the statement of the children. Apparently, not only did this prevent uh, justice from being made in this case, but also making justice that would give truth to the family. And not only is this an omission, but also an act of institutional violence against the family of Nadia Mucinho. With regards to the mechanisms that have been established, protocols, gender violence alerts, and the working group the uh, state of Mexico is asking about, Unfortunately, our position at Amnesty and the one I can explain as an expert is that in Mexico, there's a series of mechanisms. We have um, robust legislation with institutional infrastructure that is expressed in the special public prosecutions with all these guidelines and protocols. But unfortunately, all this is not uh, translating into justice for the victims. If we listen about here, listen to the case of Nadia Mucinho or many others around the country, all this legal and institutional infra instruct, uh, infrastructure is not providing truth, justice, and reparation for the victims and their families. As I mentioned, these public prosecution, prosecutor's office have a series of hurdles in their way so that victims can uh, find some sort of solution. And of course, these can be seen in the figures of impunity in our country. 98 out of 100 crimes in Mexico are impune and homicides are not an exception, unfortunately. I must also say that since the case of Nadia occurred in 2004 until yesterday, probably, at least as far as we know in our documents, the cases continue to be uh, uh, impugned. And as in the case of Nadia, we continue to find difficulties in the system, both at a state and a federal level for victims to access justice. That is why we are here today, not because uh, we want to, but because the victims need to go to international courts to access truth. So I would like to insist on the matter of the truth, because I think that unfortunately for public officials, at the public prosecutor's office, this doesn't seem to be an important element. It seems like a, a pro, just a proceeding thing without considering the element of truth for the victims. And finally, in terms of the uh, culture of the defense, the truth is that victims in the state of Mexico and around the country uh, need organizations to assist them in order to seek justice. This is the duty of public prosecutor's office. But unfortunately, without an organization or an attorney assisting them, they cannot find the resources to have their cases investigated. I think I have 27 seconds, so I will insist on this, on the culture of defense, because I do believe that this is an act of institutional violence because the families need to face the threats and the mistreatment of these um, institutions. Thank you. Now we will start the allegations. So we'll give the floor for 15 minutes to the petitioners. Good afternoon. My name is Maria Antonia Marquez Hernandez. I'm the mother of Nadia Alejandra Mucinio Marquez, who was killed when she was 24 years old in Mexico. The responsibles are his uh, late husband and father of his children and the Mexican state, as well as his and the brother of his 
of his husband. He met Bernardo when he, she was 17. They moved in together. They had three children, Carlos, Uriela, and Maria Fernanda. My grandchildren saw the violence of their father against their mother with only five, four, and two years old when they were when they witnessed uh, how their father and uncle killed their mother. Uh, I make the state of Mexico responsible for, the, for her murder because before her feminicide, she had been a victim of different, different kinds of violence even deprivation of her freedom because she had been kidnapped by him uh, for two weeks. Bernardo had kidnapped him, kidnapped her, and they released her because of the pressure that was created. In June 2003, she presented a denounce because of this kidnap, but the authorities did not conduct any further research. They did not send any protection measure for her or for her children. The kidnap was reduced to an event of family of domestic violence, and it prescribed in 2005. In the lack, in the face of the lack of protection, my daughter and grandchildren went to another part of the country, but Bernardo found them and forced them to come back. In 2004, Nadia was killed. She was murdered. The only witnesses were her children. They saw the cruelty with which she was killed and from that day on the life of my family changed because not only because of the lack of the absence of Nadia but also because for many years the authorities have conducted the negligence the omission and the acts of corruption in they've lost important evidence such as for example Nadia's clothes that was never recovered the shirt that, that was used there the shirt used by one of the killers was was lost as well. They didn't uh, take care of the scene of the crime, allowing the families of the killers to set it on fire and to destroy essential evidence. Even if there were there was background of violence against Nadia and her body was found tied with a rope in her neck, the authorities said that it was suicide saying that the mess inside the house was just the way she lived, that it was not any sign of violence, and that the blood that was found there was not from any wounds, but it was because of her menstruation, saying that Nadia died because she wanted to, because the only thing that she had to do in order to avoid her death was to stand up. My, I was in charge of taking care of my grandchildren. They were terrified. Carlos and Uriel, with their own words, narrated, told the authorities the horror that they had experienced. During the time that the criminal um, investigation lasted, they had to tell the story over and over. And even they had to face the killers when they were very young. I also had to face them and with 14 other witnesses. I, I've taken this search for justice as part of my life. I was dismissed from, from I was fired from my work and I had to continue working at night on a workshop at home in order to be able to pay for, to afford um, the livelihood of my family. I had to ask for loans in the bank in order to, so as to be able to ask for experts analysis to prove that my daughter was killed as my grandchildren has said from the very beginning. In 2007, one of the murderers, Isidro Lopez, called El Matute, was uh, arrested and processed he was sentenced to 42 years of prison, but an appeal court released him in 2010 by determining that my grandchildren were not able to differentiate the truth from a fantasy. And they said that my daughter had not been killed, but that she had committed suicide. We didn't want to accept this resolution, but, and we appealed, but it was rejected because it was determined that I did not have any legitimacy to act in the process, as if being the mother of a killed daughter did not give you the right to ask for justice. 
That's why one of the killers is right now in freedom. He's free without any possibility of being sentenced again. Our fight is not over. We continue asking for the arrest of Bernardo, who in 2012 was arrested. In this trial, we could present different uh, experts proofs and evidence that allow us to show more evidence to the judge. There was a conviction of 42 years later on, but this resolution was not definite. The family, the Musinho family, cannot continue waiting, waiting for justice to be conducted in Mexico for my daughter, Nadia. There is uh, a ruling against one of the, of the two responsible people, but the other one is free, free of all guilt, free I apologize. So I'm waiting for human rights that the Mexican authorities will express in this hearing so that this, so I, so I ask you, what can be done? I'm asking for your answer. Are you going to talk to the judges? Are you going to say something to, are you going to investigate the judges and the public officials that continue working in the Attorney General's office in Mexico? Or are you going to arrest Isidro again and to charge him again for the murder of Nadia? Commissioners? The Monsignor family is here today raising our voices and asking for justice for her and for all the women that are killed in Mexico every day, eight out of which die because of the violence of their partners. Thank you, and I give the floor to Yvonne Roa. Thank you very much, Antonia. As it has been said in this hearing, in the case of Nadia Mussini, it is representative of the thousands of cases of women that are killed by their families in Mexico, and in particular, in the state of Mexico. In, this is one of the most violent places for women and for girls. Feminicides that are committed within the framework of domestic violence are a clear example that these kind of crimes could be prevented, they could be avoided. That is to say, when a woman is killed by their partners, it's because the authorities did not comply with the previous obligation of prevention, care, and taking care of one of the most frequent kinds of violence, more expanded and more normalized that we have, family violence. According to the National Institute of Geography and Statistics, 19 million women in Mexico have experienced this kind of violence throughout their relationships with their partners. According to the evidence, since the time Nadia Mussinho was killed, there was a context of gender violence, a series of deficiencies from an institutional point of view in order to provide protection to the victims, as well as many obstacles so that women could have access to justice. With all the context, uh, the context still prevails. That is to say, there is a lack of compliance by the Mexican state to create prevention or protection to these victims. In addition to this, there is an incompliance and non-compliance by the Mexican state for their specific obligation of protection because Nadia Musigno during 2002 and 2003 went to the protection system and to the General Attorney's Office of Mexico, showing and telling the authorities what she had been experiencing, the violence that both herself and her children were experiencing. So she trusted the institutions of the state and they failed. As you could hear, said by Antonia, one of the most important elements that Nadia suffered before, be, before she died was being kidnapped. Faced with the seriousness of this effect, as it was acknowledged by the Mexican state in 2017, that was understood as family, oh, that was sent to the family violence group. But that was never further investigated. There is only the testimony of the victim and no further research. There was a prevalence of the gender stereotype showing that family violence is something private and it addresses an area where the state should not apply any controls. In February 2004, one of the sons of Nadia had told what he saw. I quote, my father and Matute 
pushed my my mother into the bathtub and she cried to be taken out. They took her to the bathroom again and they killed her. They put a rope around her neck and killed her. Then Matote left and my father, my dad left as well. I went with my sister and brother to um, my neighbor's house because I was very afraid. Our neighbors asked where my mom was and I said, she's at home, but she's dead. I end the quote. The voices of the only witnesses were, of this crime were silenced by prejudices because they were children. This was committed by many authorities, in particular by um, judges, that by releasing Matute or Isidro, they considered that the declaration of Carlos and Real, the children, were, I quote, not enough not adequate and not um, skillful, and they did not have any value. They were vague, they were imprecise, inaccurate, inconsistent, and that they were in contradiction with the testimonies gave by the, um, by those, by the father and their uncle. In this case, Nadia was not the single victim of a continuum of violence. Their chi her children were victims as well. The three of them never received state protection. They were never considered to be victims of the family violence. And once her mother, their mother was assassinated, they never received psychiatric or psychological uh, care or services by the Mexican state. The only thing that they received by the authorities was indifference and even cruel treatment, inhumane treatment, as when they force them to face the murderers, even if they were children. In terms of the investigation of this crime, crime since Cal Campo Algodonero to the case of Ochoa, in Mexico, the authorities commit some irregularities and negligence act since the beginning of the research for the death of a woman. Irregularities that were present, not only in this case, but which are also part of a generalized context, as the expert Edith Olivares has said. In this case, there is impunity. Even one of the responsible has been uh, sentenced, even if it is not has been charged, even if it is not a firm ruling, the other one is completely in freedom. He's completely free and there is no possibility in Mexico for him to be charged again, despite the fact that the um, inefficiency of the officials favored him. The mother of Nadia was not allowed to participate in the trial or to appeal the final result, but there were institutional violence acts against the family, in particular against uh, Nadia's children, and that the final ruling that set Isidio free is based on gender stereotypes and prejudice about childhood, in addition to covering all the irregularities that were committed by the uh, officials during the investigation. Now, in terms of the negligence and the omission conducted by the authorities, this happens be because the Attorney General's office in Mexico, they said that many of those uh, attitudes or behaviors are already dismissed and they cannot be considered crimes. So institutional violence is not only in the internal process, but also in the international process, because the Mexican authorities, in order to say that there is a lack of violation to human rights in this case, in particular, the mistreatment suffered by the mother and the family, they said, during their communications that there are there was no such mistreatment because the family had not presented any kind of denounce before so the mexican state said this and it makes um, a presumption about the truth of the data presented. So for the Mexican state, if a woman does not denounce violence, she's accepting violence or she's saying that there is none. Even if there is a denounce, the state would not do anything. That's why we say that institutional violence is also reflected in the fact that over three years, the Mexican state had not sent to the Inter-American Commission any observations about the merits of the current case. That's why they are minimizing the importance that violence against women implies against women and children. Despite the case of Nadia, is a representative case for this other pandemic that we are currently experiencing in our country, and in particular in the state of Mexico. There are questions that we need to pose ourselves. 
why after 17 years, the case of a woman with family domestic violence, with people that were identified and where we have witnesses, why 17 years later, it is still left with impunity? Why so much time to condemn the people who are guilty? Thank you. Now I will listen to the state for 15 minutes. Thank you, Honorable Inter-American Commission for Human Rights, Honorable Commissioners, Maria Antonia, representatives, and of course, um, my colleagues from the Mexican state. The state will be clear. The multiple violations committed by it against the human rights of Nadia Alejandra Mucinio Marquez and her family members brings us to this hearing. This space invites us to eradicate that time when talking about genders and femicide was unorthodox and could even mean uh, something to be uh, to, that was ridiculed in places like the place where Nadia Alejandra was murdered. The terrible violence Nadia Alejandra was subjected by her then partner and the lack of protecting institutions in terms of her rights with the transversal and intersectional approach led to the uh, tragic result and the violations of the rights of her family members who after her death in 2004 started an admirable fight for justice, which unfortunately did not yield the results our society is demanding. Ms. Maria Antonia, once again, you have our respect but also, and I underline this, you have our commitment to be there for you in the process to dignify you and the 11 indirect victims that are including, included in the merits report. Even though in 2004, the crime of femicide did not exist, and even though the Mexican legislation did not um, have ex official pre prevention measures for gender violence victims, the uh, lack of efficient uh, norms needs to be identified as a structural failure that constitutes a violation. As was stated to the represent representatives and Ms. Maria Antonia, the state will not refute any state, uh, sorry, any action that is a violation. Now the government of Mexico has a punctual government to the rights of women towards gender equity and the prevention, sanction and eradication in uh, of violence against the women with the uh, superior interest of women, girls, and adolescents. And now the state will present some of the transformations and measures of non-repetition that has adopted to prevent that cases, like the case of Nadia Alejandra, continue to occur. 2004 is not far away only um, in years, but also uh, at a structural level. Now I will give the floor to Dilcia Espinosa so she can share the position of the public prosecutor's office. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen in the commission, my dear Maria Antonia and dear colleagues who are there with her. The investigation of the crimes linked to gender-based violence has evolved substantially in the past few years in the state of Mexico. As a result of the work of the authorities and the families 
not only in visibilizing violence, but also in uh, defeating stereotypes so as to build the institutional and legal structure with a gender perspective and human rights approach that allows access to justice and reparation of the damage. Since 2006, the uh, Public Prosecutor's Office created a special office for crimes against women and crimes related to family and sexual violence, aiming at uh, paying special attention to these crimes. Then in 2011, we saw the creation of the Special Prosecution's Office for Femicide, which investigates facts that are crimes within its competence, and it can also um, file lawsuits and intervene in um, criminal proceedings. Right now, the um, public prosecution has 11 specialized agents in the state of Mexico. Then in 2012, there was a creation of the Centers for Justice in the state of Mexico, which coordinate and articulate private and public stakeholders so as to provide institutional, personalized, specialized services with unified criteria for women and their children who suffer violence. So far, four justice centers have been installed in Multiplanescali, Ecatepec, Toluca, and Amecamec. After the declaration of alert for the um, alert against femicides, since 2015, the, our office has been participating in the mechanism for the follow-up of security, prevention, and justice measures to address and eradicate violence against women, adolescents, and children in Mexico. Several state agencies are part of it, as well as the 11 municipalities that have an alert. There was also a group created for the attention and investigation of high impact affairs related to the violent death of women. And uh, it has uh, guidelines for the investigation of these kinds of crimes. This group reviewed a total of 538 investigations. Then in 2016, the unit for analysis and context was created for the investigations of um, crimes related to disappearances and femicides in the state of Mexico. And this is the first unit of its kind in the country because it has created a criminal methodology unit which incorporates contextual um, investigation and uh, all cases in order to identify patterns and the origin of the um, criminal phenomena. And thus, the Femioni OMI platform was created, which is a database for homicides and murderers and femicides um, since 2015. The erogation, sorry, the information saw in this platform sheds light on these kinds of cases. It allows for the progress of the investigations for the uh, provision of new uh, evidence and provides information about these processes. Nadia Alejandra, as well as all the other, the other victims of femicides in Mexico, has left actions that have led to mechanisms of non-repetition. One of the most emblematic ones is the construction of a system for the attention of collectives and family members. And uh, with regards to the attention for children, I would like to discuss Project Antenas, which uh, acts as an interactive, um, an interactive uh, video for children, which is a therapeutic tool. And through uh, animated characters, it is managed by children's therapists, and it's monitored by a uh, closed circuit. Antenna has been used by agents of the um, public prosecutor's office to interview children who may have been victims of high impact crimes. That's all for us. Thank you. We will now give the floor to our colleague in the Executive Commission. 
Thank you very much. I would like to uh, greet the commissioners, the ambassador, the public officials. I would like to say that after all these actions that were uh, discussed, the government of Mexico created in 2015 the Executive Commission for the Attention of Victims and the public prosecutor's office requested the commission to acknowledge uh, victims and to create the registry of victims. Now, several institutional actions have been carried out in favor of uh, Nadia's family. For example, school scholarships for 2019 and 2020, 2021, and we will also be at their disposal for next year as well. We are working to um, help them with our um, job platform. So now through an agreement for collaboration, we will give more collaboration and protection to the victims since they will have the possibility to find a job. We would also like to offer the support and the services to uh, Maria Fernandez Lopez Musinho, who is the granddaughter of Ms. Marquez, who still hasn't refused this, re received this benefit on behalf of the state of Mexico. We are at your disposal to provide psychological or psychiatric support for Ms. Nadia and all the members of her family. Uh, and we would like to support you in everything we can. Thank you very much. Honorable commissioners, Ms. Maria Antonia, representatives, even though the killing of Nadia Alejandra, and I want to be clear here, was committed by private citizens and it's a civil uh, crime of a civil nature, the state of Mexico is responsible for several violations to the human rights of Nadia Alejandra and her family. And all this needs to be translated into specific action, not only to comprehensively repair the damage done to her family, but also so that they will become a reference of a continuous structural transformation in terms of a differentiated approach based on the pro persona principle established in our political constitution. Honorable Commission, Ms. Maria Antonia, family members of Nadia, the state has a moral obligation and has also the conviction to uh, provide you with a comprehensive reparation roadmap based on the acknowledgement of responsib the responsibility of the state and focused, of course, in providing dignity to those who were victims. And the efforts will be coordinated by the Secretariat for uh, Governing, meaning the Ministry for the Interior, focusing on their dialogue with you, Ms. Maria Antonia, your family, and of course, your representatives. Thank you very much. That's it for the state of Mexico. Thank you very much, Mr. Moreno, for your participation. Now I will give the floor to the petitioner for five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Madam Commissioners, representatives of the state, my name is David Peña of the Grupo de Acción por Derechos Humanos. Alan Piñón is here with me, who will address you as well. We recognize the disposition of the state of Mexico in this hearing. We also recognize the normative and infrastructural progress that has been made throughout the years. Nevertheless, and unfortunately, all these transformations have not had an impact on the prevention, care, and elimination of gender-based violence, and especially in this case. These are actions with good intentions, but they, have, they haven't had the results expected. As we have mentioned, and as we have proved, the proposal of a comprehensive roadmap for, to repair the damage does not solve the um, 
actual problems that have to do with the omissions and violations of the human rights that were committed during this case. In part, actually, many of them are not even part of the proposal of the state. And even though they're good disposition, none of the representatives of the state has provided an answer for the, to the questions asked by Ms. Maria Antonia and neither have they answered or proposed specific responses apart from a set of good intentions. This femicide could have been solved days after it happened. The responsible men could have been detained and convicted. And even worse, this femicide should have been prevented. But the authorities back then, as is the case with the current authorities, are part of an impunity system that continues to be in force in Mexico. This case did not mean a major challenge because the uh, gender-based violence was expressed in the body of Nadia. The body of women who are dead are the best witness to the violence they have suffered. Also, the perpetrators had been identified, so a case that was quite easy to be solved, has been impugned for 14 years. But this is based on the uh, failures of the institutions, as was recognized, but also uh, on the lack of sanctions of the officials who do not comply with the law. But its main pillar is located in the belief that domestic violence is not an affair of state even though in their discourse, authorities may say the contrary. Nevertheless, these structural factors cannot be considered the justification for the lack of compliance of the obligations of the state, because that lack of compliance stems from a series of material decisions. For example, they have decided not to give the, um, this, the uh, state attorneys to give them the necessary re resources. They do not comply with their own measures. For decades, they have decided not to investigate family violence cases, and they have decided not to train public officials. But the worst decision is that of made by the state of not developing a comprehensive national strategy to address feminicides. The violations of the state started from the time when Nadia went to make a denounce and no authorities paid attention to her throughout um, the analysis, the discrimination of her children and the in institutional discrimination to her mother, extending the violation to the current times, 17 years after her feminicide, when her family is still asking for an essential right, the right to justice for that family. Justice for Nadia is not only translated in the fact that Isidro Lopez will be sentenced and charged because of the crime that he committed, because it has not had such an option in 17 years, but also that the public officials can be charged and respond to the inefficiencies conducted throughout all this time. This translates into measures that may enable uh, feminicides like Nadia's not to occur again because these crimes are completely avoidable if positive preventive measures are conducted in order to foster the right to a free life and to a life free of violence of women and children. Therefore, commissioners, and going back to what the representation of the Mexican state has said, that they are not going to change the facts and that they acknowledge the international um, accountability that they have, we ask that the facts of the current case are agreed and we request a merits report that shows the international responsibility of the Mexican state because of the violation of the rights to life, to integrity, and to personal freedom, equality before the law, and protection established in the Inter-American Convention related to the general obligation of respect acknowledged in Article 1.1 same as article number seven of the convention Belém do Pará in favor of Nadia Mussinho because an incompliance of the state of acting faced with acts of violence against women and the violation to personal integrity, the rights of, the, of children, equality 
in face of the law related to their general obligation of respecting and ensuring the warranties included in Article 1.1 and connected to the Convention of Rights of the Children in favor of Carlos, Uriel and Fernanda because the Mexican state knew the violence that they were suffering and they were not doing anything to ensure their protection, both physical and mental, psychological protection by being the witnesses of the murder of their mother because of all these years of victimization and the lack of access to justice. And finally, the violation to the integrity, personal integrity rights, family rights, judicial warranties, acknowledged in the Inter-American Commission related to Article 1.1 and Article 7 of Belém do Pará. Excuse me, you're running out of time. It, this, is, this is all we had to say, commissioners. Okay, thank you very much. I will give the floor to the state and you have um, seven minutes to compensate with the petitioner's part. Thank you very much to the representation Thank you for your replication and thank you, Commissioner, for giving us the floor. Uh, at the, back then, where, as we said at the beginning, we are going to send all these allegations in writing where you can see the roadmap for care and for reparation, for all encompassing reparation. So our proposal is that after these facts, this proposal that we are going to be sending you briefly, that we can continue creating structural changes, the ones that we have already mentioned here and that the um, Attorney General has already mentioned as well. Transformations that although, despite being slow, have been occurring we are going to continue complying with the international standards that are not only established in the allegations and that I insist I will send to you, but also to create, to coordinate all the different stages of the Mexican state so that we can ensure this reparation for Maria Antonia for the rest of her family and mainly that it will be reflected in the structural changes for us. Thank you. That's all on behalf of the Mexican state. Thank you, representative of the state. And I will give the floor to my colleagues of the commission. So Emeralda Rosemena, you can take the floor first. Thank you, Madam Chair. As rapporteur for Mexico and as rapporteur for the rights of children, it is, this one is a case that for the Inter-American Commission bears special weight in terms of acknowledging the rights throughout this transformation process, the rights for protection of women, protection of children, and everything that the state should acknowledge. As this is an analysis, of the presentation of both parties. I'm listening to the stance, to the declaration by the state, accepting that they are responsible, that they are taking responsibility by the state so as to establish, if possible, this concept of repair, integral repair, by means of a roadmap, which is also a formula that the Inter-American Commission also has in order to address these cases. So it is by means of a friendly settlement in this case. Therefore, I would like to ask you, I would like to ask the executive uh, secreta secretary if it is feasible by listening to all the allegations, because this would be the preparation of our merits report. This is the one that brings us all together for this hearing. Would it be possible now to listen to the mother of Nadia, Madame Mada, Maria Antonia, for the proposal that the state is currently making? I know that the procedure will continue anyway. It will, I mean, the petitioners 
will have to send their declaration to the commission. We've heard it, but she needs to send it in writing. And it's, as we've heard, it seems not to accept the response of the state, um, not accepting it as a, an all-encompassing repair proposal. Commissioner, Madam President, I don't know if it is possible to give the floor to her that, so that the the executive secretary can take the floor as well, because the state has given arguments. And we will see this further on with further details when it is sent to us in writing, um, everything concerning the rights of children, because they have been involved in this process as well. And the response, the protection response for all the victims of this case. Therefore, Madam President, do you think, Madam Commissioner, Commissioner, so if you agree, I will give the floor to Commissioner Piovesan in case she has um, any questions, then to Madam Blanchard so that she can clarify that point. And then the last few minutes, both the state and the petitioner can take the floor again. Madam Piovesan, do you have any questions? Thank you, um, Madam Mantisha. I have two points. First, to acknowledge the to acknowledge the responsibility by the state, international responsibility, and the responsibility to create structural changes from now on. So that's acknowledged by the state, the willingness of the state for creating this new roadmap. I would like to know from the petitioner's point of view, with solidarity to Mrs. Antonia, in the tragic case of Nadia, what she considers that would be the adequate repair for Nadia's children. I would like to know from her perspective, from Antonia's perspective, which would be the adequate repair in order to assess whether there is uh, like room for creating this roadmap. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Piovesan. So we'll give the floor to Commissioner Blanchard in case she wants to clarify what um, Commissioner Rosemena was asking. Go ahead. Yes, Madam President, thank you. Yes, indeed. We've heard new information in this hearing. So the way we should proceed is to receive it in writing and then to have an answer in writing by the petitioner's party as well. And in the case, there is the willingness to start. To start a roadmap for repair, we will need to know it in writing as well. Okay, thank you for your clarification. Therefore, I will give the floor for just a couple of minutes, two or three minutes to the petitioners and then two or three minutes to the state. So petitioners uh, part, um, there was a question for Mrs. Antonia, go ahead. I would like to thank Mr. Marcos for your proposal of this kind of for this kind of repair yes to support the musinho family of accepting the violations to human rights i thank you and i accept the state acknowledging that they made a mistake therefore for us for the musinho family for um, for Nadia's children that are adults now, I'm uh, a great grandmother right now. So we want justice now. We want Isidro to be charged. We want him to go to prison and to pay for the death of my daughter. We also ask for the public officials that were part or that committed this kind of negligence act, acts that they will be sanctioned as well. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Antonia. Now I'll give the floor to the state. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you for your comments. Madam Maria Antonia, for us, 
it is not an option to make this repair. It is an obligation and it is a conviction by the state to act in such a way. So we are going to send our uh, we are going to make this repaired according to the inter-american standards so that you need it so that you can create this acknowledgement for all for everything that will be and everything will be sent in writing as well to be included in the in the merits report that the state of mexico violated many rights and we are responsible for that i just have to Thank you. I want to thank you again, Madam Maria Antonia, for your presence here and for joining us in this roadmap to the construction of a repair road ahead. We are going to send all the details that are pertinent from our side, including the allegations sent in writing and you know that the doors are open for us to start a new dialogue for the construction of a repair road that you consider adequate. Thank you. Thank you. So we need to wrap up this hearing. I want to thank the representation of the state, Madam Ambassador, and each of the representatives that had taken play, have taken part from the state. I also acknowledge I also want to thank you for acknowledging your responsibility. And I do, all the commission thanks the presence of the representatives of the state. I want to thank my colleagues uh, led by Madame Blanchard and that have been working on this case. And in order to close this hearing, I wanted to talk to the petitioners and to thank all of you, but especially thank Madame Maria Antonia. I'm really touched, I'm really moved because of your fight, because of your strength, and because of the continuity of what it means, of what gender violence means. In addition to the concrete case of your daughter, Nadia, feminicides show gender violence in continuity. You represent the fight of many mothers that take over the uh, take over taking care of their children of their grandchildren so on behalf of the commission our respect uh, for your fight and our commitment to continue monitoring this case and i want to, re to remind all of you that in this public current hearing there are many mothers like you asking for justice so we value your presence a lot. The expert, the members of the state, we thank all of you, but mainly you, Madam Maria Antonia, our greatest respect and solidarity and our commitment from on behalf of the Inter-American Commission with your fight, which is the fight for your daughter and for your grandchildren, but for many other women in the region that are waiting for justice. And this is the end of this hearing. I thank you all and have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon to you all. Buenas tardes. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes.